since launching this program in the spring of 185 films he produced following his move to the US in 1993. Sorry for the I will now turn the floor to Raphael and I wish you all a wonderful evening back in time. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for the welcome speech. Uh, thank you to Villa Albertine. And uh, I'm very happy but very impressed to be the first resident to have to do such a presentation. So, so that was the first. Um, I'm very happy too, also, because this uh, research about Gaston Méliès has been a research going on for many years um, for me. Gaston Méliès is not a new subject to me because I've already done two movies about Gaston Méliès, but now that his years in the USA, done it about his years after the USA. Um, the only thing is that when I was interested in his Pacific voyage, which uh, in the years 1913, uh, I then discovered that he had done far more things in the USA than I knew, and I also discovered that very few people knew either in France or in the US. And in fact, every time I talk about Gaston Méliès, generally people are surprised that at first to know that there's even a Gaston and not just a George. Um, and the confusion arises also, arises also from the fact that the two brothers uh, have the same initial, they are G, yes. And some of the movies made by Gaston Méliès in the USA or elsewhere were labeled G Méliès on purpose, of course, because they wanted to play with the fame of the Méliès name. And that is one of the reasons, I believe, that he disappeared largely into oblivion, um, because only the Méliès name remained associated with George.
something striking that someone with such a famous name in the history of cinema? New York. Gaston arrives in New York in November 1902, followed a few months later by his son, Paul. Settling down in the center of Manhattan, Gaston was appointed general manager of the American branch of the Midias Company, better known as Star Film. But soon, the movies sent from France by George are not enough for the American distributors who are chasing Gaston for more. Gaston starts to shoot his own newsreel, and then his own films. But the East Coast climate doesn't allow for Westerns to be shot all year round. West. In 1910, Gaston is the first filmmaker to move his studio to San Antonio, Texas. There he finds sunshine all year round, and a large number of true cowboys do act in his movies, giving this authenticity that he seems to be looking for. In 1911, he goes even further west, 
and builds his picture farm in California in a small place named Sulphur Mountain Springs near what will become Hollywood. As a matter of fact, the first Hollywood studio, the Nestor Studio, will be built only six months later, in October of the same year. Gaston Medias is part of the pre-Hollywood pioneers paving the way for what American cinema will become. In December 1911, he leaves Sulphur Mountain Spring to move his studio and staff just a few kilometers from there to Santa Paula. It is here that Gaston Melies lives with Hortense at the corner of Main Street and 7th Street. He is constantly filming comedies, but most of all, westerns, like this one, one of his last. The Cowboy Kid, theatrically released in the USA on Independence Day, July 4th, 1912. This Frenchman is a pioneer. He is one of the early adventurers of the Seventh Armored and filmed some of the first westerns of the 20th century. This amazing cinematic journey at the end of the Belle Epoque and at the advent of the early cinema has practically disappeared. This cinematic pioneer fell into oblivion, largely eclipsed by his younger brother. Indeed, his family name is famous, but his first name is unknown. His name was Melius, Gaston Melius. Yet Gaston's story is almost as extraordinary as that of his younger brother. While Georges was making imaginary trips in his Montreux studio, Gaston traveled the world for real. So I think that gives you a nice overview of who he was, what he did. Um, out of the 185 movies which were produced, which sounds uh, like it's huge today because 185, 185 films, it's gigantic, but those were what we call, most of them at least were one reeler, so in bobine. Um, most likely uh, it depends between 8 to 10, 12 minutes sometimes. Um, which was the standard of the industry. Um, he stopped making movies almost exactly at the time when the movie industry started producing longer films. Interestingly enough, also, he was there before Hollywood truly started. Well, of course, other filmmakers and producers went to California in those years. Um, but the Hollywood film industry started and for instance he also stopped and even left the USA before Chaplin came to the USA so we are really talking about the very early uh, uh, era of film making and film production and what I'm interested in also in the figure of Gaston Elias is of course the opposition with the brother George um, one is the um, sci-fi we call him the father of science fiction film um, and the other one is doing things which are more like what like today sometimes we could call travelogues, which leads to documentary filmmaking. When he goes to the USA he, or to the Pacific Ocean, he's not going to do just fiction. Sometimes he does documentary, doc documentary films. Um, and um, also he engages with a great variety of talents 
including American tenants of all sorts. Um, in, in one of the reasons why you wanted to go west, and it's, a, it's, it's going west cinematically speaking, uh, it's like the, the cinematographic conquest of the west, which actually, if you go back to the history of the west, is part of the uh, making of the myth of the west, you know, the representation of the west. Um, and he's part of it, partly because he also wants to be true uh, to uh, reality as much as possible. He wants real natural decor. He wants as much as possible real cowboys. That's why he goes to Texas and he hires this bunch of cowboys who are going to follow him to California from Amsterdam, who are real cowboys. They were just like, you know, branching. Um, they were not actors. Um, so he does that. and. He, he hires quite many Latino actors uh, uh, when he's in Texas, which also is very interesting because the, those are some of the first Latino roles on screen played by Latinos, not uh, uh, brown-faced or uh, these kind of things. He doesn't go as far as this, as far as I know, uh, when it comes to the representations of Indians or unless that's in movies I have not seen and movies which are lost. But still, he's, he goes in that direction of uh, going towards a more modern form of cinema and in that era, which is um, a very interesting era of a transition. It's not the early, early days anymore, and it's not yet the new industry that we're going to know after World War I, for instance. And in those few years, 1910, 11, 12, 13, that kind of uh, Proceed the, the World War One. That's when he's acting. But it's also a very difficult era because a lot of things that have been done in those few years have been totally forgotten. Um, many people just destroyed their movies, or the exhibitors used to destroy the copies, but they don't keep the prints. Um, and also, um, the fact that World War One came kind of erased those few years of creativity right before it. And on top of it. We had the mistake, if I may say, of dying in 1915, which is right in the middle, during World War I, at the time when the world was really busy with something else. So that went totally um, Another dimension um, of um, the story revolving around Gaston Melies, and that's why I call it American Melies, that's how he was nicknamed by some of his actors, um, is that um, his cinema, of course, he's still a Frenchman and he's still uh, there with his wife, Hortense, and he still needs a life which, in a large part, has a French lifestyle. But most of his cast, almost all of his cast, uh, is made of um, American. And let me just go through a few uh, additional images I want to show you about that. So, Gaston Méliès, of course, that's him with his. Lenin like goatee, you know. It's really, uh, um, that's him in New York, um, in a building which still exists today. It's uh, on 38th Street. We were just talking about it before. Uh, the building still exists. Uh, it's still right there. It has not moved. And um, he lived there for at least eight years distributing George movies at, at first and then starting his own production. And that's him in uh, Texas, Texas or California. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the Star Film Ranch in mm -hmm. Texas. Yeah, in, in San Antonio. So the locations where he worked were New York, uh, based on the 30th Street. Shooting first in Brooklyn, near Prospect Park, um, then in Fort Lee. Unknown location so far, and I'd like to probably know more about Fort Lee and the French community in Fort Lee in those days. But strangely enough, it's undocumented. And 
and even the family, as far as I know, doesn't know. Okay, well, yes. um, then he moved to Texas, San Diego. Um, we found, I've not been there yet, but I think we found the place where it was, the plot of land still exists. And the barn, which is on the left side of the image, apparently still exists. The house does not exist anymore. It's been in place in the 50s or 60s by a new house. But the owner of the house still has the barn, which is strange. It's barn from the beginning of the 20th century, which was featured in the movies. It appears in many of the movies by the yes. And then he moved to California, two locations, one north of a small city called Santa Pola. And the, it was in the mountains, and it's called Sulphur Springs Mountain. Between Santa Pola and Ojai, 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 and after a few months, he moved down, down to Santa Pola, which in fact is just uh, what 50 minutes north of the road. Yes. And then he left. He decided that he was um, he gave sort of a press conference in those days in San Francisco when he decided to, to leave. Um, the USA and he was tired of the comments. He, he, he felt he had already, already explored the subject enough, and, and too many people were coming out to California to do the same, and he was trying to do something else. else. So I, I think he left maybe, maybe at the wrong time, time. he should have still been going. So that's for the, the different locations. So, so this one was in Texas. Texas. And this, this is the, the kind of movie he shot in Texas, Texas which I wanted to mention. This one is a still or oh, uh, photography from the the, the, the Alamo, uh, which is the first screen adaptation of the Alamo battle, the one with David Crockett. Um, it's the Mexican army, that's the Mexican army. Um, played largely, in fact, the right, most soldiers, in fact, are from uh, an American uh, unit based near San Antonio, which they hired for the purpose. Um, this movie is uh, a predecessor to the famous Alamo movie by John Wayne, for instance, 50 years before. Uh, this one is in 1910. Um, and it was, that's interesting, it was shot on location last year, in San Antonio, knowing that the mission and everything is still exist. Uh, the, the movie is lost, so uh, no, unfortunately. Um, I, I know some people who would very much like to find it, who dedicated a large part of their life to, to, to this movie. Um, but perhaps it will surface somewhere. That's the beauty of um, these kind of things from the past. Uh, sometimes you go ask, uh, I don't know, like a Congress or the French Cinematic for some movies. It happened to me with Gaston Maillet before. They have only one movie. Then you come back three years later and they tell you, oh, we have one more. In fact, you're like, oh, I can't. <laughs> we didn't know we had it. You know, it was not properly catalogued. So movies keep surfacing. Lost movies are um, not necessarily always you know, lost forever. But this one so far is lost. So out of the 185 movies made in the US, there are roughly 15 that have survived. I have the files of 13 of them, so that's for sure. And there are two or three more to be found in different archives where we have been yet. Uh, no, it depends. Uh, some of these movies can be found uh, as far as New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, New Zealand being a good place to find old movies because that was the end of the line. I may say they would, they would ship movies. Uh -huh. And then they would not send them anywhere else. It ended in New Zealand. So they kept that. So the New Zealand Film Archive, very rich with lots of movies. They, you can also find, they found some uh, George Méliès movies, which we didn't have in France anymore. So, and they have uh, a copy of one of the Gaston Méliès movies made in the US. That's the house where he lived in um, Santa Paula the house he bought with his wife Hortense, which makes me think he wanted to stay initially a bit longer. For whatever reason, given the evolution of the industry, he decided to move on. 
and they went on to their trip to the Pacific in 1912-13, and when they came back, Santa Pola, they just sold the house and went back to France. The um, house has been destroyed. There's a public park now um, standing in the same plot of land. Interestingly enough, and I find it quite moving, his wife, Hortense, which was his second wife, um, lived many, many years after he died. He died in 1915, she died in 1913, something like this, um, late 30s. And when she moved back to France with him, they went to Corsica, different places. He died in Corsica, and then she bought a house near Paris, and she named it Villa Santa Pola. So she gave the name of the last place where they lived in the US, which means, I think, that their life in the US was also something very special to her. So there's Melies, and there's, uh, there are the Americans. <laughs> um, among the Americans, there are a few characters I find very interesting, and I'd like to explore their uh, story connected to their years uh, working with Melies, of course. This one is very important, very forgotten too in the US, is Francis Ford, not Coppola. Just Francis Ford, the big brother of John Ford. And he was in the movies before John was even able to do a new movie. Um, so that's not the real name, because Ford is a stage name. Um, they have an Irish name, which I forget, not a name. And the first one who took the stage name is John, the older brother. And he was an actor who joined the, the Melias troupe, he became the lead actor, the tall, dark, and handsome, le beau brun ténébreux de la troupe. And he acted in quite many movies with, with, with Gaston Melias. Um, that was the beginning of his longer career. And I find it very interesting that the, the different trajectories of someone with the Melies name and someone with the Ford name meet uh, in 1910, 11. So you really have two big family names uh, of the story of cinema. So you meet, but both of them are forgotten. Because who remembers Francis Ford, brother of John? Very beautiful, even though John, uh, uh, John Ford had his brother act in some of his later movies, but he did not create him all of them. Brother's um, Good looking guy. This is one of the lead actresses, uh, Edith Story, um, who was also one of, one of the lead actresses. Texas months spent with uh, Castamelia's troop. Then she went on to join other companies and she had a longer career. She was very young, I think, when she played with Melia. She was about 19 and 20 years old. She has very interesting parts um, because she can play a kind of a tomboy. Uh, and from tomboy to cowboy, well, she can play the cowboy. And she rides horses. She looks like a, like, a, like a man. And here again, that's something I'd like to focus on my research here and the treatment I would like to give to the whole story. Is also the signs of modernity you can find in the movies done by Gaston Méliès and his troupe. Um, he gave many parts to women, including to that one. There are many other actresses, but this one might be the most iconic. And I think some of the film historians in the USA that I'm working with subject would support the idea that she was really iconic. She would deserve to be uh, recognized again um, because she was really one of the precursors of what a female star would become. Uh, no pun intended, but she played for the star film. So. And she had many roles like that. Uh,
it's a nice car presenting some of the actors and actresses that played with him. Some of them were like really the cowboys, you can see them but some are more like the lead actor, Francis Ford over there, and uh, Eddie Story again. And that's how they were marketed in those days in the, in the usual um, early film magazines. enemy of many people, including um, Gaston Reyes, no, I'm exaggerating, but he, he is one of the characters in the story, because of course, Melies and his company in the US um, had to deal with Edison. And he's, uh, he's, uh, he to have the monopoly of everything. And uh, there were many stories of uh, trials and suits and stuff, legal proceedings and, and uh, Edison is definitely a figure in the story as he is in the story of many other people because he's always the looming figure. He's the Darth Vader of that era in the film story. He is. Do you know who this is? That's uh, Sarah Bernard. Sarah Bernard came to the USA for one of her many last tours. And she gave many last tours, but she could never stop. So I don't know if it was really the last tour or if there was another one after. But there were certainly uh, farewell tours before this one. But she came again in 1911, and she met with Gaston Elias in San Antonio. It's kind of exotic. And there, there was a meeting. Because I guess these people from the industry, the movie industry, but also from the, what we would call today the creative industry, um, were in contact somehow and knew of each other and wanted to be in touch with each other. So that's part of the story. Um, this leads me back also to the figure of the, the wife of Gaston Melias, who we put in the picture of in my presentation, I forgot. Hortense Meyers. Um, she was um, the second wife, but before that she was an art teacher and a painter in Paris. Um, she was a very forceful person, so she had uh, definitely an opinion about things and uh, had certainly some input, creative input, into the movies made in the USA. She even wrote some of the scripts, so that's another interesting thing. One of the things that really um, interests me in that story is the um, the fact that it's really a collaboration between two industries which at that time kind of could come together in a way that we can really do in the same manner today. Um, and I think it's extremely interesting to see that um, so many people have come before us and gone to so many places before us. Uh, we are never the first. You know, uh, I'm just only trying to trace the footstep of Gaston Melies in the USA, and I'm going to do it by plane. And it's already <laughs> it's already challenging because you need to organize that, and that that can be done thanks to the support of the Villa Albertine. But honestly. I'm really amazed when I look at how creative, adventurous, um, and all these people And when they were filming things, it could be used 
for whatever the footage could go into fiction sometimes or could go into documentaries. And that's more obvious in the movies made in the Pacific, of course, but I think it's true too to some of the movies made in, um, in the USA. Adding to that the fact that these movies now are so old that beyond the narrative value that they have, which sometimes is to be really debated because they are not always great movies, they are just on par, I think, with what were the standards of the industry back then. They are no better, but they are no worse. Um, some of them have very interesting creative but sometimes some of them just go also with the flow, you know, I mean, what the audience wanted to see. But today they have acquired a, 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 a real um, document value. And I think they should also be valued for that because we can see um, um, places, we can see people. The more time goes by, the more these things acquire um, uh, a historical value and a cultural value that goes beyond just their um, sheer creative value as a, as, a, as a movie, as a product of the industry. Um, so that's all of that that I'm trying to embrace during that residency. Um, and I'm hoping to, of course, trace the footsteps, see the places, but also meet people like you who might have access to some information that I don't have, or some knowledge about things I don't know. Uh, and for New the New York area in particular, uh, I'm thinking of the 40 um, story, which uh, has been documented by some of the historians here. But strangely enough, in some of the books uh, that have been written about 40, there's usually no mention of, uh, of Gaston Lewis, even though he was he was there uh, exactly at the same time that other filmmakers were maybe better known to some of them, like Alice Guy Blaché, the, the French director. Uh, we know of the Solax, you know, and we know where he was, we know what she did. Strangely enough, we don't know much uh, about the star film in, in, in France. So I think if that um, residency here has something to bring, is for research, that's the first step. There's a research. The first step is the research is finding out more, which is why I'm already in touch with some uh, American historians who are some of the few specialists I know about Gaston Elias here. I think you can count them on your hand. Uh, one of them is in Texas. Uh, she's in Austin. It's Professor Kathy Fuller Sile. She's in the Austin University of Texas. I think Another one is Frank Thompson, who is not in Texas anymore, but I meet him in Texas. And he is, as far as I know, the only one who has written a book about uh, Gaston Elias in the USA, and it's about the star film ranch, so it's not in Texas. Um, apart from that, and um, maybe other people that you know but I didn't know, it's still very limited. So that's the first step. And the second step is, once all of that research is to try to tell the story of Gaston Elias in America, uh, but not through the more classic documentary form that I use for the trailer, um, but through something a bit more hybrid also, which uh, would bring together actors, the Americans of course, but together with the archive. The idea would be to really make full use of the archive that we use, because 13, 14, 15 movies that's a lot of footage that can be reduced to the film of today. Um, and I think the interesting part would be to um, go into this form of hybridity again that was, I personally, I believe, totally present during the early days of cinema, which was a bit lost afterwards when we tried to categorize the different genres, you know, of filmmaking, documentaries, documentary, fictions, which and so on. And I think that hybridity is being rediscovered today thanks to, thanks to the digital era, which makes a lot of things more uh, and things also more fluid. Not only in terms of different genres, but also in terms of uh, harnessing different material. And a lot of things in terms of archives have been digitized. 
including some of the movies done by Moliès 100 years ago. But if you were looking for these movies maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, you would never find them on digital file and then getting a reprint or whatever, or access to a reprint would have been extremely difficult. So I think today um, we are at a time of new transition. Um, and it's interesting to look back uh, 100 years ago at another transition era. Thank you. And yes, if you have questions. Yes, thank you. I wanted to know if you, your research has uncovered anything about Star Film in New York City. Uh, it was certainly one of the first French companies to establish itself as a distributor, as an agent of, of his brother Georges' films and other French films. Have you done much research in that area? Because that's actually a very important turning point in terms of the film industry. Yeah, we have started doing some research on this. Um, personally, I'm interested in the distribution business that the Milias Brothers had, which started in 1903 in the USA. Uh, and the interesting things, something I didn't know before um, until rather recently, is that even though Gaston Méliès left the USA in 1913, his son, Paul, remained. And he was still active in the distribution industry in New York, and he had an office not on 30th Street, I have the address, it's somewhere else, in a building that still exists also, and he was active until 1920, strangely enough. And he was distributing not just uh, Méliès movies anymore, because the Méliès brothers were not making movies, but he was distributing other things. Um, so yeah, I think there are many more things to be uncovered when it comes to this. And um, strangely enough, the uh, New York leg of the story is the less documented, the, the least documented, the least known. Uh, uh, far more information about what happened in Texas. <laughs> but maybe that's thanks to the work done by some of the historians there. Uh, also far more information about what was done in California. But New York, it's a mystery. So you're welcome to help or suggest. Uh, yes. uh, thank you. I was just wondering if there were some connection with Alice Guy. Um, I think I will write a scene where they meet <laughs> in my movie, <laughs> but I will make it up. Uh, okay. I don't know. I, I absolutely don't know. I've been asking the question if they met. Uh, they must have, I mean, believe, because Gaston Méliès was quite active in the French film community in the years he was in New York. There was a French film, there, uh, there was a French community actually in New York in 1910. They used to gather at uh, an hotel, I think there was a Lafayette hotel or something like that in New York in those years, I it somewhere, and there was a French restaurant that they used to meet. Um, so I suspect that a French filmmaker like Gaston Méliès and a French filmmaker like Alice Guy must have spoken somewhere sometimes. But Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I was wondering how you count 185 films because what is your definition of a film? I didn't do the count, sorry. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's a question that I'm raising that it might be worth looking into, because when you say each one is a reel, at the time, I don't think they had the same concept of editing and putting reels together to tell a story with a beginning and a middle and an end. So if we think about it in those terms, Charlie Chaplin made 400 films because he was shooting all his essay, all his rehearsals. So if we count every little bit and piece uh, of the film that he shot, then of course it comes to 185. But are these really films oh, yeah. or are they footages? No, no, they are films. Really? With a story? 185 movies with a title, oh. a synopsis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All found in, I didn't do the count and the, the, the research and yeah. that was done by largely, uh, I suspect Frank Thompson was the first one doing it. Um, and it was done 
using the uh, magazines of the, those days, Motion Picture World and stuff like that. So everything was published. They, they had they had a, a, a complete industry with magazines included. Yes, times with with the, the release dates, so you would know when they would have been released. Um, the synopsis. But most of them are lost. Some reviews, yeah. But out of the 185, 15. like I said, there are about 15. Mm -hmm. I've seen 13, but I think there are, there are 15, yeah, 15, 15 or 16. Yeah, that's it's fascinating. But there were no, no, there were yeah. real uh, movies, uh, beginning and an end and the story. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, the great train robbery, 1903, <laughs> beginning, middle, and yeah. end, right? Mm -hmm. um, two questions. Um, are there journals? Did he leave journals, any sort of letters? Um, it would be interesting, because I'm curious about his, his um, uh, interest in America, too, like what that might be in terms of his own mm -hmm. mindset. Mm -hmm. and the other question I have for you is, as they were traveling, these countries, did he shoot all that? Is there footage at all left of the travel? So about the letters, um, as far as I know, letters from America or about America, I've not seen any, but he may have sent some. I've heard that he may have sent some to some of his family members back in France and so on. He was writing also to George occasionally. Um, but I haven't seen. So there's not there's not like a source of uh, a box of letters by Gaston Méliès when he was in America. There are letters he wrote during his Pacific trip around the, the Pacific Ocean, which he sent to his son Paul in New York. So those letters have been published by the Méliès Association in France. So that documented the trip. But we don't have the equivalent when it comes to the USA. Did he write in French or English? He when he wrote to his son, he wrote in French. His son spoke, spoke and they spoke French together. Um, but Gaston Méliès was also sent to the USA, I believe, because he's the one who spoke English uh, the best in the family, because he had been living in London at some point. Um, and his son, Paul, spoke very good English, uh, and that I know from the other side of the Méliès family, the other branch, not the Méliès from France, but the Méliès who are not called Méliès anymore from uh, England, because the descendants of Gaston Méliès and then Paul Méliès uh, are now British. They, they live near, one of them lives near London and the other one somewhere else in the countryside. Um, so they are the great grandsons of Gaston Méliès, two brothers. Uh, I'm not sure they want me to say, so they are very discreet. Um, huh? No, but they do, they do, they do give the name Méliès as a um, a middle name sometimes to some of us. So you can be called so, ta -da, but yes. Um, and as far as I know, so they don't have letters from the um, What was the other question? Ah, uh, yeah, no, I have not seen anything shot during the different trips. But I suspect they may have done it and used it in some of their fiction films. Because, for instance, when he left uh, San Francisco boarding an ocean liner in the San Francisco harbor, uh, when they were going on board the trip from the pier, to the, they started shooting a movie. Uh, because they thought a, a trip to, on an ocean liner was of interest uh, in terms of narratives and, you know, so they, they did that, and then they did that all the time during the Pacific trip. Uh, so I suspect they may have done it a bit in the USA, but I have not seen that in the movie. But they shot many things in Texas. You have quite a few movies that remain that show different Texas uh, locations. Um, you see how the San Antonio uh, 
Riverside was, and so on. The same for California. You see the surroundings of Santa Pola. He went to film in, um, uh, what's the name, the, the islands of uh, Los Angeles, Catalina, uh, San, uh, Catalina Island, S uh, Santa, S uh, Catalina, Catalina Island. Yeah, yeah. He went there fishing, and he went, <laughs> and he went there filming. Um, yeah. Yes, re regarding location, um, I have met this very old, grumpy old man in Texas, um, in Alpine, West Texas. Mm -hmm. And there's a mountain called Movie Mountain uh, near Alpine. And apparently, it's because of Gaston Melies who shot around this mountain, and they call it the mo Movie Mountain. So I just wanted to know if it's true. And that's a interesting Yeah, it's a nice piece of news. Thank you. That's Makes a movie, my day. movie mountain in West Texas. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. Uh, do you know where is the Grumpy Old Man? My God, I, it was in Alpine, Texas. Um, um, but it was, um, he told me about this mountain. Um, it was interesting. very, very old. It was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. and so he told me Melies, and I thought, like, George Melies? I didn't know about Gaston. Yeah, of course. And he couldn't, he couldn't say, so he couldn't tell. So um, there's this maybe it's a, you know something to explore for you because this this movie in West, West Texas you can come up on this one, but it's very interesting. It's not for clean. But you see my my um, reaction about uh, Gaston and yes, being Gaston, and, but being mistaken. George, you know, happened to me also the first time I, I, I encountered stuff about Gaston Melies was in Polynesia. I was going to Polynesia in 2000 for other reasons. But I was also interested in the movies that were made there early on and stuff. And I found something in, uh, in some, sorry, in some, sorry, in some uh, publication of the 1940s. There was a note about G. Melies having shot Polynesian movie. And like, G. George Melies, you know, George Melies. really never heard him. He left Paris, you know. <laughs> he was always in his Montreux studio and he didn't go very far. And of course, then I found out that oh, there was a Gaston, but nobody, nobody tells you anything. You know? So there could be um, opportunities actually to find out more about Gaston Melies. But it may just be, it may just seem to people that it's not Gaston, it's just George Melias, you know what I mean? So there's a line of confusion that adds, uh, there's a layer, an extra layer of confusion to all of this. And it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a source of not only confusion, but uh, of, uh, shall I say, a bit of a game sometimes, maybe, that was played willingly. Or willingly by the brothers to blur lines and when you blur lines too much well, it comes blur. Ah, okay I was gonna say uh, yeah I, I was gonna ask is that that's the yeah yeah okay ah, I've seen it then. Okay. don't so then it's sorry but this one was uh, There is a story so, but maybe there's a background to that story. Or maybe it was a source of confusion. It's 2011, that's about 10 years ago. It's about when you have the story. So you see? <laughs> Sorry. I, know, I found the same link. Same thing. So I was going to share the... <laughs> Credible? I was just wondering, I don't know if you'll know, but you spoke of the importance and that he was a pioneer in having Latinos play Latinos and women play cowboys and representation. And I was just wondering at what point that might have changed because you know, representation is so huge today. So I don't know if it was the American studio system that kind of reverted that, and the, but the moving away from the black and brown face. I was just curious to know more about that. What do you mean that change went after? Yeah. 
or just why, if he started it and that it was no, going in that direction? I, not, oh no, no, I don't think he was the only one. You know, he was just part of a trend. But I think he was aware enough of the fact that it was interesting to include, start including women in lead roles. And, and that if you do have some people of uh, Latino descent or you know, to give them the roles, <laughs> you know, instead of like, putting makeup on someone. But he didn't do that when it came to, as far as I know, to Indians or to uh, roles of uh, black Americans. Or, but I'm not even sure I've seen, I've seen black Americans in these movies. I'm not sure there were many black Americans anywhere in Texas in those days. So, but it was not the only one because when you look at uh, movies by D.W. Griffith, well, you have the same issue. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but interestingly also, I, I think the fact that um, there was an awareness of the place of women, of the suffragette, Thing is also partly due to the presence of his rather active wife uh, next to him. And I, I, I bring I bring her up quite often, but I'm not sure it's of interest sometimes to people <laughs> because she's not a, she's not a filmmaker per se. But you know, she was there. And when you look at photos, um, you often see a lady in a very belly pop you know, kind of dress and with a hat and feathers and she's always around so she was on set she was you know she traveled with him um, and she had a part to play and I think that was important the man was not alone um, he traveled with his wife and actually he married this lady Hortense in 1907 when he went back to Paris to see his brother speak about many things I believe including about what to do with the business and also uh, on, during that trip decided to marry this, uh, this lady. Uh, he went back to the USA with her, and that's after that also that he started being far more creative and daring, uh, and even daring to become a film producer like his brother, which was not necessarily an easy thing in the family. So there, the story that they didn't get along so well, um, in particular because uh, George is said to have said, but later on in his, year, in his life, many years after um, Gaston had died, that uh, Gaston just made lousy movies in America and stuff like that, and he never sent the money, um, which is not exactly true, I think, when you look at the accounts, because the family has a lot of uh, um, invoices and stuff between the two branches of the family, and obviously Gaston may have sent quite a lot of money to, to George. That would be a very large amount of money today. And George had his own money problems. He was not necessarily a good businessman, so he didn't make all the good decisions. And his type of cinema was going down in the 1908, let's say, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, and the type of the fantasmagorie, the fantasy movies that he was making were getting out of fashion a bit, which I believe, that's my own interpretation, it kind of led Gaston to say, hey, I'm in the USA, <laughs> there's something happening here, they're inventing a new genre of film, it's the Western, even though it was not exactly called like that back then. Uh, let's do it, you know? And, and he, he was also supposed to, to provide movies to the distribution network that he was part of, and his agreement or whatever with Edison, it meant that he had to deliver a certain number of movies a week, if I understand correctly. So, if George was not providing enough movies, which he was not, then someone had to do it. And Gaston went into business. But I think he also wanted to try his hand ahead. Not that I know. No. No, not that I know. No, George remained in France. But the Gaston went back quite often, and he sent his Paul, his son Paul, also to work with it until George in the year uh, 1909, So there were connections between the family, of course. Interestingly enough, George was not particularly 
influenced by the Western style. He could have. Knowing his brother was in America, you know, doing it. But no. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Thank you.